Common Emitter Class A Amplifier, Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, also known as The Gritty Details. Today is the analysis episode. I explain in great detail how the circuit actually works. The next video is going to be the practical one, how you find the resistor values and such, to put one together. Theory and practice. I like that. So let's begin. It's going to be a long one. The first thing we have is the signal. This is your voltage varying source, such as your AC power or, more likely, your audio clip. It could also be the output of a previous filter or amplification or whatever stage. One side is, of course, referenced to the common ground, negative terminal zero, throughout the whole circuit. Anything that uses the signal all has to share this reference point, otherwise it'll all get garbled. Immediately thereafter, we have our volume knob. If this is just one in many links in a chain of filters, you're not going to have a volume knob, but this is basically for if you have speakers or an oscilloscope or whatever. This is how you control the amplitude for your human pleasure. If the resistor is at zero, you get the full amplitude, whatever that may be. If you turn the resistor all the way up, you get minimum amplitude, which doesn't mean zero. It means whatever trickle of current is left. Some speakers, if you turn the volume all the way down while they're still on and listen very closely, you can still hear output because it's just grossly limiting it, not completely turning it off. And then a capacitor. This capacitor has the minor role of removing any bias on the signal. There shouldn't really be a bias on the signal, but just in case there is. But it has the major role of... From the rest of the circuit, whatever we do in here, it makes sure that the bias doesn't get back into here. The bias we introduce in here, I'll get to that in a moment. So it DC isolates the input from the amplifier. Similarly, we have our output, our load, which could be another filter or whatever, but in this case, it's probably a speaker. It, of course, is similarly tied to the reference voltage, and similarly, it has a capacitor that separates it from the amplifier. So you could view this capacitor as setting the bias reliably to zero and blocking the bias from getting back through. And over here, it blocks the bias from getting through and sets it to zero. So both of these are bias reset points, if you will. So we get to a known zero bias, we introduce a bias that we decide on, and then we go back to a known zero bias to actually use the signal. So this is basically the input and output, nicely separated, to visualize just what part of the circuit is the actual amplifier. These can vary depending on what your input is, whether it's a link in the chain, whether it's a plug from a device outputting audio, whether it's whatever. And the same for the output. It could be another link in the chain, it could be a speaker, it could be an oscilloscope screen, or whatever. But now we're in a known state, and here's our thing. So, an example signal, an input signal would be something like this. So that might be your input signal. And then over here, same axes, we have the amplified signal. So you can see it's higher in my wonderful little drawing. You can also see it's flipped. See, it goes up then down, and here it goes down then up. This is an inverting amplifier. When I show you the actual circuit, well, you've seen the actual circuit, but when I explain the actual circuit, I'll point out exactly why it's inverting. But that's basically what's happening is, at this point, basically due to this capacitor, we have this nice input signal, and then processed by this capacitor, we have the nice output signal that's recentered. So before I begin, of course, a reminder, we're using a transistor, an NPN BJT transistor, in fact. So let's remind ourselves of how the transistor works. We'll have this up there for reference. Let's draw a graph. I'm going to let the horizontal axis be the voltage across the base to emitter junction. This is the control junction. So this will be voltage, base, emitter. So this would be zero volts, negative volts, positive volts across base to emitter. The vertical axis I'm going to say is the current through the collector. The collector to emitter passage is the thing we're actually doing. Base to emitter is the control, collector to emitter is the result. That's where the amplified current goes through. So the collector current, base and collector current join together in the emitter, rather coming out of the emitter. The collector current is purely the amplified result without anything else. So when the voltage is zero, the current is zero. It's just off. Recall that the base to emitter junction functions similarly to a diode, a PN junction. That's the NPN part. So we have a certain voltage, which is about 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Let's actually write a 7. We'll say 0.7. So until that point, 
your transistor is basically still off. Until we forward bias this junction, it's not going to do anything. We're not going to worry about the negative end because that's goofy and we don't need it. So I will remove the negative end. We have no reason to negative bias the transistor because it doesn't work normally there. You can do stuff, but it doesn't work normally. We want normal. Normal is good. So starting at point 0.7, the base emitter junction is forward biased and you start getting your current through the collector. Now there will be a certain maximum current through this. So when the transistor is off, in fact let me do a very quick thing. Imagine we have this situation. So we have a nice Kirchhoff's loop here. Assume the transistor is on. Assume we are past this 0.7. We've got a voltage drop across a resistor, across a resistor, and across here. When the transistor has just turned on, we've got barely enough base to emitter voltage to forward bias it and turn it on. But there's basically no current going through there, which means there's basically no current going through here. We're still at this rough zero point. The voltage drop across this transistor is going to still be the full voltage drop because both resistors are ohmic devices. V equals IR, Ohm's law. If there was current, then there's voltage. There's no current, so there can't be any voltage. So the voltage drop here is at maximum, and these have zero volts dropped. As the current increases in this path, current going through the resistor means they have a voltage drop. So if this is a nine volt supply, at the beginning this will have zero, zero, and nine in the middle. But if we get more current through, there might be one volt here and one volt here that leaves seven out of nine over the transistor. If this becomes 3 and 3, that leaves 3 for the transistor. 4 and 4 is 8, and that leaves 1 for the transistor. But at a certain point, the current will be such that the two resistors combined have the full voltage drop, because it keeps going up and up and up and up. So when this transistor reaches a zero voltage drop, it's basically no longer part of the circuit. Basically at that point, the resistors are determining the current. The transistor does not create current, it chokes it off. When it is fully opened and fully conducting, it's not choking it off, it's just not there. So the current cannot go higher. Total voltage, total resistance, V equals IR, I equals V over R, and that's your maximum current. Nothing can increase the current past this. You can't have more total voltage drop over the resistors than the supply. So this can never go negative, it's gonna stop at zero, roughly. So there is a point on this graph, there's a voltage across base to emitter that causes the transistor to open fully. At that point, we get the maximum current. We'll say it's right there. So the voltage is enough to open the transistor fully. Its voltage drop becomes zero because the current has increased to the point where the resistors have the full voltage drop. And that's the maximum current it will ever be. So if we increase the base to emitter voltage from there, nothing will happen. Maybe slightly curved, but basically nothing will happen because the voltage drop never really gets exactly to zero. So it goes down tiny, 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 tiny bit. But basically it's a flat line. It's fully open. So this is is the cutoff region of the transistor. It's cut off. This is the saturation region of the transistor. Neither of these regions are useful. If we get into these regions, we clip our signal. The useful region is the region that can go up and down. And it's not linear, it's wiggly, but it's linear enough that we just accept the very small distortion because such is life. So when the transistor is on, but the base current is basically still nothing, the collector current is basically still nothing. At this point, the transistor is fully on, so the voltage drop is essentially zero, and the current is at maximum. So we can vary this current up and down and up and down and up and down by varying the base to emitter voltage by plugging the signal in, and that's how we can reproduce the signal in the transistor. And then we get the amplification by having a high supply voltage through the transistor, making this high. The same way you can use a 5 volt Arduino signal with this as a low side switch to power on a 12 volt motor or a giant LED array or something with a separate power source. That's what the amplification is. We have a signal source which is weak. It could be an oscilloscope function generator. It could be the audio port out of your computer. Could be any number of things that are not going to provide you with much power. Just the voltage with little current. And then we amplify with an external source, batteries, or plug it in the wall. That's how the amplifier works. So that's why we're varying the current. But similarly, let me have a different vertical axis. Instead of collector current, we have the voltage drop across collector to emitter. So when the transistor is closed, in this active region, we'll just worry about the active region, when the transistor is essentially closed, it's forward biased, but there's no current flowing, the 
collector to emitter voltage is at a certain maximum, right there. And then when the transistor is fully open, when the base to emitter voltage has gone up high enough, we're down here roughly at zero. I'm trying to not draw over different color markers. So we get another line that's basically the opposite. The more the transistor is open, right, the smaller the voltage drop here, the greater the voltage drop across the resistors, which means more current. So the current goes up, the voltage drop goes down. So this is just two different ways of looking at the transistor operation. The collector to emitter voltage is actually the way that we do look at it because the input is a varying voltage signal. The output is a varying voltage signal that has a higher voltage. So we are varying the voltage drop across the transistor, which is varying the voltage drop here, which is our signal. We'll get to that in a minute. But I wanted to go through all this just because this is the most important part. This is the meat and potatoes of it. I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing about transistors and having their operation repeated to you over and over and over, but they are one of the most important things in electronic circuitry. Transistors are everything. They're the steak. You still need the garlic and onions to put on the steak. That's your resistors and capacitors. But the transistors are basically what makes everything possible beyond a light switch. So let's begin actually making our amplifier. So recall that the base to emitter junction has to be forward biased to operate. So on our voltage graph, if our input signal is this, in order to operate the transistor, we have to have a minimum of, let's say, 0.7 volts, and then we have to put this signal up there. This is the input. So this is the virtual zero now. We have to move the signal up into the region that the transistor operates in, because this is a class A amplifier. We are reproducing the entire signal unaltered. Class A amplifiers are power hungry, but high fidelity. So this is the bias we're protecting against here, removing here. We gotta move this up to work with it, and then we move it back down. So to do that, we use a voltage divider. So we have our actual power source, two resistors, out to our, of course, shared ground, negative, reference, zero, and there's where our signal comes in. So the signal comes into the middle of this nice voltage divider. It's a simple Kirchhoff's law operation. This voltage drop and this voltage drop add up to the total voltage of the supply, be it five, nine, 12, 24 volts, whatever. This is the power, the additional external power. V equals IR, V equals IR, because you have I, the current, because of the Kirchhoff loop. Total resistance versus supply. And then if this is 100 ohms and this is 200 ohms, then if this is nine volts, then you have six volts here because 100 ohms over 300 is one third. So one third of the voltage is gone over this resistor. So nine goes to six, just a voltage divider. Now, this is vulnerable to many effects, the most important of which is noise on the power supply. No power supply is perfect. So if this nine volts, right, this nine volts, so this three volts and this six volts, if this goes up to 9.1 volts, the proportion does not change. This is still dropping one third of the total voltage, and this is dropping two-thirds. But one-third of nine is less than one-third of 9.1, or rather, one-third of 9.1 is greater than one-third of nine. So there is a greater voltage drop here. There's a greater voltage drop here. So it changes the number. In fact, it's gone up because this voltage drop is the voltage at this point. So nine volts is actually six volts here. So there's six volts across here. So now it's six point whatever. So the bias is now increased. Power supply goes up, bias goes up. Similarly, if your power supply dips to 8.9 for a moment, then this is dropped to two thirds of 8.9 rather than two thirds of nine. Your bias has gone down. So you are introducing that noise into your signal because the way you see your signal is you have a set voltage here that never changes. And this voltage pushes through or pulls back through, basically adding to or subtracting from that spot. And if this spot is moving, then the result of pushing is moving too, so you add noise. We're gonna get rid of that in a second. So now we have the other half of the amplifier. We have our input power again. We have our signal out, it's gonna be that spot. And this might be familiar. I showed you this a minute ago. This is our transistor line. And this is our output signal that's going to get the bias removed again by this capacitor. So you can see that when the current changes through this transistor, the voltage drop changes across the resistors. We just went over all that. So the voltage at this spot is changing based on the voltage drops of the components throughout this loop, this line. And that's changing the output voltage into the nice curve. It's controlled 
simply by the biased signal. So you have your bias, and the signal pushes or pulls through the bias, and it affects the base to emitter junction. And there you go. So this resistor, first of all, limits the current through your transistor so it doesn't explode. Second, it limits the current through the load. So a class A amplifier like this, a common emitter class A amplifier, has what's called high output impedance. It can be pretty low if you use strong components that can dissipate a lot of power, but it's still a lot higher than a couple ohms that a speaker would prefer. But it'll still work perfectly fine. You just need more power. But most importantly, this resistor is setting, based on the current through it, the voltage drop across it, which sets this point. And now you should be able to see why the output signal is inverted. This may look familiar as a low side switch if this is the main load. This resistor is small. This resistor is much bigger than this resistor, so this one's incidental for now. This is basically your load resistor, and here's the load. So it's a low side switch. I think I said low, but it's a low side switch. So when the input signal is on, when base is high, an emitter, of course, will be low. The transistor is on, so the low signal is connected through here, and you're getting low as the output. Whereas if this input is low, then base to emitter is forward biased here. We'll say it's just barely forward biased. Then this transistor is not conducting, so you're getting the high voltage out. So high here means low here, and low here means high here. So it's inverting. The more this signal goes high, the more current goes to the transistor. More current means more voltage drop, which means this point is going down. Now, the fact that it's inverting for something like an audio application is completely irrelevant because positive and negative is just one side or the other of the diaphragm. If you have a speaker and you walk around the speaker, well, let's say you have the speaker pointed up rather than forward. If you point the speaker up and you walk a circle around it, it's not gonna matter. If you do have the speaker pointed forward, it's gonna get louder and quieter because the sound is going that way, but the sound itself is not going to change. It's not going to sound different based on where you are relative to the speaker. It's just going to change in volume. So for a speaker, it doesn't matter which side is going which way, as long as the signal is being reproduced by the diaphragm. If you have additional filters or whatever going on, or you're reading this signal, if your load is the input pin of a microcontroller that you're using to make an oscilloscope, then it's going to matter. You need to know it's inverted, so on the screen you flip it back, for example. But for audio, we don't care. Inverted is irrelevant. So that's all this resistor does. It does the voltage drop to make the signal output. Now, the final piece is this resistor. This is the most important resistor in the entire circuit. The first thing it does is very easy to understand. Power supply noise. So we said when this goes up, when this voltage goes up, the current goes up because the resistance has stayed the same, which means the voltage drops go up and the bias goes up. But we don't have just this loop now, we have this loop. Through this resistor, over here, through the base to emitter, and through this resistor here. So just the same way the current went up through both of these resistors, the current has gone up through this resistor. So what happens then? The voltage drop here gets bigger. So when the voltage drop here got bigger, the bias moved up. When the voltage drop here gets bigger, the base to emitter junction goes up because the base to emitter junction, when the transistor is on, is effectively a diode. It's always going to have its 0 0.6, 0 0.7, whatever, roughly. That's just going to stay the same. So this fixed constant number is going to move up because of this varying voltage drop here. So if the power supply goes up, the bias goes up. It does go up but so does this. So they go up together. So the entire thing just gets shifted and the actual signal is roughly the same because the amplification is relative to the base to emitter junction. This is our window for the actual signal. This voltage drop can't be part of the signal. In fact, this voltage drop being here reduces the maximum amplitude our signal can be because we don't have the full supply voltage anymore. We have, at the very least, the voltage drop here squishing everything up and we have to work within that window. So basically when this resistor gets a bigger voltage drop, it squishes it some more. But as long as we have headroom, that's not gonna be a problem. We don't want to use every single ounce of this voltage range because then any little fly farting in New Zealand is going to make it clip off one end or the other. We want to have a healthy margin so that this can squish and the signal doesn't change. So that's the easy part. If this voltage goes down, current goes down, so drop goes down, drop goes down, but current also goes down, so drop goes down, so the bias goes down, the base goes down, and the signal just moves. The window gets bigger, the signal moves down within the window, so basically just empty space appears at the top of the window. And the other way, 
way, the signal moves up with the transistor, so the output is going to stay roughly the same. We just lose some of the window at the top. From the transistor's point of view, it's not that it's moving up and down, it's that the ceiling is moving up and down, if you want another analogy. So that's the easy part. The other part is the beta value. So recall, the current through the collector, the current through the collector equals beta times the current through the base. Beta is just the amplification factor, the multiplier factor. It's how much the base current determines the collector current. You'll see the number 100 thrown around a lot for a reasonably powered BJT of common properties, and it is. But the beta is a very wiggly thing. Beta varies by temperature. Beta varies by electromagnetic noise throughout your circuit and the room it's in. Beta varies every time a mosquito sneezes in Saskatchewan. And most importantly, beta even varies based on how much current is going through it. Looking at the data sheet for my 2N3904 transistor, the common one I use, the nice and cheap one that you'll find everywhere, looking at the first one Google comes up with at least, if you have 0.1 milliamps roughly going through the base, your beta is as low as 40. 1 milliamp, your beta is closer to 70. 10 milliamps on the order of, it's up to 100. Keep going up, it goes back down to 80 and down to 30 with a huge current. So beta is all over the place. And that's bad because the beta determines how much we're amplifying our signal. Now, if beta stayed the same, but it could be bigger or smaller, but stayed whatever value, it wouldn't matter. That would just change our gain. It would change how much we can amplify the signal. But beta is varying all the time. It's constantly varying, and that is noise added to the signal. So we have to handle that. Now, due to quantum mechanical effects, because transistors are strange, beta changing doesn't just affect the actual multiplication. Beta changing actually affects the base current as well. The only thing we want affecting the base current is the signal by varying the voltage across base to emitter up and down, thereby changing the current through the base, thereby changing the current through the collector, thereby changing the voltage drop here, setting the signal, and that's what we want. The power supply noise can change the base current, which can change beta, but we already accounted for that by adjusting the voltage. So that current going up and down is all right because we're adjusting, but even if the signal is stable and even if the power supply is stable, you can get variances in the beta from temperature changes and everything else, and that's going to mess up your signal. Most importantly, if you look here, so this positive power here supplies the negative here, and it supplies here. So the top bias resistor determines the current for both the bottom bias resistor and the emitter resistor. The amount of current going through both of these determines their voltage drop. If the base current goes up, that current has to come from here. Very little is coming from the signal source. That's the whole point of the amplification. It doesn't have much power. So this is the source of the base to emitter current, the base current, I should say, the primary source. And this is not going to change. There's a certain amount of current that can go through this resistor and that's it. So it splits here. And the more that's drawn by the base, the less goes through this resistor. Less current through this resistor means a voltage drop across this resistor, which changes everything again. But this one has an easy solution. All we have have to do is make the current going through this loop here, the bias loop, be very large compared to the current the base might draw. The usual rule of thumb I see is at least 10 times. You want the current through here to be at least 10 times the most the base will ever draw. More is better. And this is another reason. There's multiple reasons, but this is another reason that the class A amplifier is so power hungry. We want to make the effect of beta irrelevant. The effect of beta changing how much the base current changes and the base current changing beta. We want all of that to be irrelevant and we want 99.999% of the base current changing be just due to the signal voltage changing. So if this current is huge compared to this current, then what I said will happen, but it'll be very small. The more spare current is available, the less the actual absolute voltage drop will be changed. If you have $100 and you spend $10, you have lost a chunk of money. But if you have $100 million and you spend $10, you're not going to notice it. That's the principle here. Base current changing will change the bias, will change 
everything in the circuit, or rather the amplifier. But if you have so much to spare that it's basically irrelevant, then you can ignore it, and the amount of noise introduced is minimal. All of electronics is approximation. We're trying to minimize all the bad stuff. We'll never get rid of it entirely. Nothing's perfect. We just minimize all of it until the human ear will not notice, until it's below a pixel's resolution on the oscilloscope screen, until whatever, until the error is irrelevant. So we have a huge current through here, relatively, than here. And without going through too much detail, because the detail is very complex and I haven't ironed it all out yet, and neither has Google because there's 18 million different answers and nobody just says it's this. There's a whole bunch of factors, it works, don't worry about it, that's what I'm being told. Basically, by having this resistor here, and by having a large current here relative to this, by having that spare current so that current changes are minimized, and this voltage drop can vary in response to feedback throughout the rest of the amplifier, this becomes nearly irrelevant, this beta. Changes in the beta, rather. The beta itself is still important. You want the beta to be a certain amount, on average, to get a certain gain, but its variations are going to be minimized. And I've seen YouTube videos where they put different transistors in and do the numbers and it works out. I will probably do a similar video at some point to show varying beta and how much this negates that. So all of the varying betas during the run of a circuit, or switching out a different transistor with a slightly different construction, all of that is muted and the circuit still works as long as this current is high. And now because I've already had to scrap this video once, let me consult my notes. So yes, the way I have it written down, this current being very high relative to this current means that to an approximation, the current through both of these resistors will always be roughly the same. This this is drawing so little that we can just say it's basically the same. So that means the bias is nice and stable, because when we create the circuit, we assume these have exactly the same current. The circuit is created with a neutral situation in mind, and then we add a safety window. So by having this current large, it meets the same approximation we used when we made the circuit. Similarly, choosing a transistor that operates at its best beta, the highest beta possible, in the range of current we're going to get, remember 0.1 milliamps, 1 milliamp, 10 milliamps, according to the data sheet it was varying, the highest one was about 10 milliamps. So if we're using a 2N3904, we want to be giving the base on the order of 10, so maybe 15 to 5, something like that. So it will be usually around 100. The bigger the beta, the more the amplification relative to the base current, which again, the bigger the difference, the less of an effect this variation has. If beta is 100 and it goes down to 90 and up to 110, that's less of a variance than if your beta is 40 and it goes down to 30 and 50. So the higher beta is, the less the variance matters. So that means if the beta value changing, if the amplification changing is very wide and irrelevant, right? Just like this current being huge and drawing a little bit makes that draw irrelevant. If you have a huge beta and the beta changing is not that great, then it's less relevant. So just like we can say the current through here and here is the same, we can say the current through here and here is the same because the current going through the collector to emitter is much, much greater than the current going through base to emitter. The bigger the beta, the bigger that difference. So in both approximations, we can say that the base current is effectively zero and ignore it. And we just have one stable current going through both of these resistors before and after on the high and low side, which again is how we design the circuit. So better beta means it's closer to our circuit design approximation. The entire idea is to have the voltage drop across this resistor change only because of the signal, because the current is changing, so this is changing, and this is changing, and this is changing together relative to the signal. So it is changing, but we want it changing only because of the signal. And my final note is that the smaller the swing in your signal, the smaller the swing is caused by the signal, so the less this voltage varies, the less the beta is going to change. If it's about 100 and you're changing it this way, it'll go up and down, but if you go further, it'll go up and down more. So like most things in life, it's a trade-off. In order to have bigger gain, bigger gain means this is going to take up more of the safety window. So the current through the collector to emitter is going to be varying more wildly from the top to bottom of the signal, which means the beta is going to be changing more, which means more noise. But if you reduce your gain, you're reducing the effect of the amplifier, and amplification is the point. So, trade-off. Another trade-off is this resistor. You may notice, or you may remember when I mentioned, that the window is determined from the base 
to the top. Whatever drop this resistor has is reduction in the window. Every time this resistor's drop goes up and down and up and down, the window wiggles. So if your signal is too big, then it could go off the top of the window and the supply will be hit, so you'll clip, because you can't get more voltage than the supply. It could go the other way, and the signal could go too low and turn off the transistor. You never want this signal to be lower than the base. So you've got whatever this bias is, whatever this resistor is, has to be base to emitter plus emitter resistor, voltage drop. The lowest point of the signal, the most negative this ever gets, you want to bring the voltage down from the bias point only to the base point, which is this plus this, or higher. Because if you go lower, if you are removing the voltage drop of this, if you go down to 0.7 or so, you're going to turn off the transistor and it won't go past zero, which means you're clipping the other side of your signal. So the bigger this resistor is, the more stable your current is, the more stable your circuit is, but the less your gain is. But wouldn't it be nice if we could just ignore that? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be something if we could just ignore that? What if I said time and time again, figuratively speaking, a capacitor will block DC and allow AC. Well, there's our AC. It's allowing it through, but it's blocking the bias. Same here. It's letting the signal through, but it's blocking the bias and bringing it back down to zero. That sounds familiar. What if we do this? What if I have a capacitor right here? Imagine that the DC and AC are separate things. Imagine this bias and this signal are two different currents cohabitating the same wires at the same time. They're just two people walking down a hallway together. Same hallway, same process, but they're separate. The DC gets down here. It sees this capacitor and the capacitor says, be gone. So through the resistor it has to go and all that stuff that I discussed that this resistor is doing, counteracting effects of the bias changing, is still doing it. The capacitor is going to charge to the bias as a baseline when you turn the circuit on and it's going to stay there as a baseline until you turn it off. And otherwise the DC bias is going to go through here. But the signal, the signal sees this capacitor and it sees this resistor. And the old saw about the path of least resistance, in a parallel resistance situation, the lower resistance is going to get more current. A capacitor is effectively a variable resistor based on the frequency of the AC. Obviously that's not how it works. This is a high level approximation, but if you look at a properties curve, there is a particular frequency for a particular value and type of capacitor, and it has a very low impedance to that frequency. And if you go higher, the impedance starts to go up a little bit. If you go lower, the impedance goes up a lot until you get very low frequencies, such as zero frequency, and the impedance goes way up near infinity. So it's a variable resistor in that respect. So to the signal, to the high frequency components, this capacitor is effectively a very, very small, insignificant resistor. So the signal is gonna go right through the capacitor and mostly ignore the resistor, which means it's shorted to ground. This resistor is effectively not there. The DC bias is biased further by this. The signal is not. And so we get our full gain back as if this resistor was not even there. So why have I drawn it in red like it's optional? Because it is. Capacitors introduce distortion. This is probably going to be an irrelevant amount of distortion. The stronger your amplification, the less the distortion will be noticeable because the distortion is not directly proportional to the amplitude of the signal. It is, it, okay, let me not screw up the technical term. It is directly proportional in the sense that amplitude going up increases distortion, but you're not going to have half your signal distorted at high amplitude. The higher the amplitude, the less of the amplitude is distorted. So a very low signal is going to be distorted probably noticeably, but a loud signal such as what's coming out of the speaker with lots of watts going through it is not going to be noticeably distorted. So that's your trade-off. You get less gain or you get distortion. So one more trade-off, one more compromise, you just decide whether or not this is worth it to you. And that's basically how the circuit works. One more quick run through. We have our signal. This is the volume knob that can restrict the current, thereby restricting the voltage because it's a voltage divider with all of the other resistors. So this will simply change the amplitude of the signal as if it was that amplitude in the beginning. This blocks the amplifier from sending crap back through here. The voltage divider biases this signal to be up in the transistor's operating range, the active region. We don't want a bias too high or too low, because otherwise the signal will clip. And we don't want a signal that's too big, 
at the start, or it will clip then too. We want a small signal, which is good because it's not supposed to be providing power anyway. A small signal is good for the signal generator, and it's good for us. And then we want the appropriate bias. We'll figure out how to calculate that bias tomorrow. It changes the voltage across base to emitter, which changes the current across base, or into base, which changes the current through collector, which changes the current through the resistors, which changes the voltage across the resistors, which changes this point, which changes the output. So we get our signal, the capacitor removes that bias, so it's back down to zero to go through the load. And if the high impedance here is too much, and your load is not getting enough power even with this capacitor, you can increase your supply voltage as long as your parts can handle it. So you'll get the same proportions and the circuit will work in about the same way, but you can then increase your gain safely because you'll have a bigger window of voltage because this down here is not going to increase by very much. We'll get into the numbers tomorrow. So this is only one way to do one type of many types of amplifier. I'm going to be talking about different types of amplifier for the next year, probably, peppered in and out as I use them. I'm not focusing on any one thing. I'm not going to be an audio channel. I'm not going to be a an AI channel. I'm going to be a general channel talking about the basics, talking about projects. This channel is supposed to help you understand, but it's also supposed to give you ideas. So you can go out and become an audio engineer. You can say, this is kind of cool. And then you can catapult past wherever I managed to get and become an audio engineer. That'd be great. And while you go do that, I'll be seeing you.